I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioners, that brings us to the uh, approval of this evening's agenda. So our agenda for tonight's meeting, February 28th, along with the regular and closed session minutes from the February 14th meeting and the Roads Board and Sanitary Commission minutes also from February 14th have all been circulated for uh, the commissioner's review. Uh, are there any additions and or corrections? Make a motion uh, to amend the agenda to include two additional action items tonight. Second. So we have a second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept the agenda as amended and all of the minutes as submitted. Second. Do we have a motion? We have a second. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. All right. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Jack. All right, that brings us to uh, our first press and public comment section for tonight. And um, I think we do have some folks here tonight. So thank you for taking the time to express your views to our county commissioners. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. Comments longer than three minutes may be submitted in writing. This commission respects your desire and right to convey your message freely. When you come forward, please speak clearly in the st at the standing microphone. State your name, your address, and your topic of interest. And in keeping with the dignity of our office, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. Uh, first, we have Earl Chambers. Good evening, commissioners and all others. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. My name is Dr. Earl Chambers III, and I'm a longtime resident of the county. I am here to uh, address the Love Point issues that we are all, all now aware of. Um, I'm here as a concerned resident of Ken Island and only recently as an organizer for the Love Point Citizens Coalition. Our concern became evident when we were notified with a billboard posted in the entrance of our community of a proposal for a large-scale Bay Bridge resurfacing project to occur in the east side of our neighborhood. That's uh, Love Point along the banks of the Chester River, which otherwise a DNR facility is present and is now a storage and uh, training facility. Given an approximate month for this inquiry to the state and DNR, we set out to discover and uncover what seemed to be a breach of what we were told years ago was Project Open Space. Each week reveals the order of magnitude of such a product, project. After much persistence, and we received cursory answers from the DNR and other state agencies. And when they couldn't answer the contractors in Ohio, Kokosing and McLean would give responses. There were many inconsistencies and remembered and remember the devil is in the detail so here it goes tonight we are here to help you help us with finding a better solution to a very large and tough problem what is the best location for the resurfacing of the bay bridge which is in dire need of such extensive repair the needs this needs to be done but please consider the following the project is more expensive number one the project is more expensive than the alternative site so we're looking at Love Point being excessively expensive compared to the alternative. Um, most likely, it's because DNR gets a free overhaul of the property and shoreline, and then the barging is also an added expense. Number two, where are the cost analysis of the alternative site, and can we as, a, as public have access to those, those uh, analyses? Number three, we have a, a rather chaotic public meeting last week, of which I think a few of you had attended, and uh, we were hoping to have a little bit more of a presence and a little bit more um, sharing of this information in a little bit more civil way. But uh, we'd like to continue to allow people to make educated decisions. Uh, number three, or excuse me, number four, this is a concrete project, no doubt, an engineering marvel that has never been before accomplished when you're talking about this type of engineering. The number of concrete trucks, rebar, steel, support vehicles, and employees over the years, now 2,700 for one phase of a four-phase project means there's going to be over 8,000 vehicles going down Route 18. And I think we're going to have a little bit more elaboration on the next individual who's going to talk about that. Originally, the history of the land was a ferry boat landing and such. Um, 
the high intensity construction vehicles that would otherwise be coming down this road um, include tandem axle uh, concrete trucks. Number six, the risks are elevated when you think of the population and demographics of the drivers in this section of the island. We uh, are looking at some, some very fragile uh, individuals. We've got the high schoolers, we've got the senior center, we've got a daycare center, all within this first segment of Route 18 headed north. Um, Mr. Lastly, Mr. and most Mr. importantly, the, the idea of the time, project. For the sake of time, would you mind emailing that yep. to the commissioner's office? One more point. All right, go ahead. The last part of this is, is really near and dear, and that is what the end use of the products that we're basically relining the bridge with. That has been proposed to be dumped in the Chester River, and we now know that open bay dumping is f way out there. That's just not even acceptable means of, of, of getting rid of this concrete. And um, lastly, uh, our objectives, we would like to have our commissioners to gain further insight into this project and attain more details, and in particular, the site and cost analysis of the alternative site, and then provide this, the public with a statement and guarantee their constituents that they have their safety, health, and well-being to the entire county and in our future. Thank you. Please email that to us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tracy Moon. I'll save you some time because I'm with Earl. So, um, My name is Tracy Moon. I live on Love Point, 150 Kent Ave, and not far from Earl. The two of us are here to represent the community, so I will save you a little bit of time since he ran into mine. Um, we have come here, obviously, to ask you for your help. And as we started to peel back the onion, we spent probably eight weeks just trying to get a straight answer on some very simple parameters regarding this project. The, the one that impacts the county the most, which we'd like to seek your help in, is the impact on the roads. And um, it seems to be something that has been getting brushed by in questions that we ask. Now we realize the county knows what the roads need. You must have some dynamic with the state that is responsible for Route 18. I respect that, but as when I even contacted them and I contacted our own Board of Works, they were unaware of the project and so unaware of the amount of traffic. And that is what, is what has caused us the most alarm because we use that road. As you know, it's very rural. We use the road for joggers, horseback riding, bikers, and things like that. And we're just seeking simple answers. What are we going to do? What are we going to do about our safety and the health of the community when this traffic, which, by the way, we are completely against. We don't want the project at all, as you know. But if that were to go forward, how can we be prepared to address it? And so we wanted to ask you to implore the state to hold a briefing for you of this project, since we found out so many people were unaware of it. And um, as you do that, Earl and I have mountains of information that we'd be happy to share with you that we've discovered. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Captain Robert Newberry. Commissioners, my name is Captain Robert Newberry. I'm chairman of Delmarva Fisheries Association. I live in the fantastic town of Crumpton, Maryland. Um, you've heard what these people have had to say tonight. and. You know, I don't live down there, but I am a citizen of the county. My major concern is the end use, and I've talked to a couple of the commissioners about this. Um, as you know, Delmarva Fisheries, we are affiliated with the Clean Chesapeake Coalition, which we are also glad that you are members of, which is a very good organization. And the end use is going to be that they're talking about taking the large sections of the bridge and dumping them off of Love Point at the reef area. Um, no, that's not going to happen. I mean... Regardless of who it does, we're going to fight this tooth, claw, and nail along with the clean Chesapeake because the only thing that we want to put in the bay is what belongs there. Shell, more oysters for the fish and everything. What the major concerns of with the bridge are the amounts of chemicals that are in the patching process from the old bridge. It's 50 years old. They're not going to be removing any of the steel. They're just going to be dumping decks out there or breaking them and putting them over. Um, as you do know that uh, the Bay Foundation hoodwinked a bunch of people into thinking that it would be good to put the same type of material in the Lynn Haven River down in Virginia. Now it's costing them $3 million to take it back out because of the toxin levels. And it's is unacceptable to have uh, this material put in the bay. It does not, if, you know, the good Lord wanted concrete there, he made the bay out of concrete. And 
what we're looking at is the long-term harms and the effects it will have. We have now the support of the Kent County Commissioners. They are against this. I've talked to the President, Ronnie Fithian. They're going to discuss it tonight in their meeting. Um, also, the um, great uh, organization that you are very proud of in this county, uh, Queen Anne's County Watermen's Association, they are not in favor of this matter either. And specifically with these people that are down here at Love Point, I mean, you know, they look at it 24-7. We're on it 24-7. But I implore to you that there has to be some form of a meeting with the county commissioners, with the citizens down there, with the watermen from both Kent and Queen Anne's County that discuss these very pertinent issues of putting this concrete in the water. It doesn't belong there. It doesn't need to be there. If they're going to do anything, they can put shell or something else in there that's organic and natural, not the concrete from a 50-year-old bridge. So, I mean, these people have a justified feeling for what they're looking at in their infrastructure, but I also am looking at the end use. And, you know, if, if we're not trying to delay this project. We're not trying to kill it. Just we want to make sure it's done right so that you were not sitting there with a big clean up that somehow the county will have to be involved in. It is state waters, but I thank you very much for your time and thank you very much. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Newberry. Um, Chris Blanton. Chris, how are you? Hello, um, my name is Chris Blanton. I live in Churchill. Um, I'm here for school board funding and uh, school safety. Now, bear with me. I will make a connection to the uh, county commissioner. So just last year we had a massacre in Uvalde that built a movement to make our schools safe. 19 kids were executed, two staff members. We thought that moving forward we would have safer schools, especially in a conservative county. We would have a you know, school resource officer being a sheriff at every single school, which I assure you is not happening. I understand that there may have been funding, but I can assure you it's not happening. Now we find out that the school board is going to fund a $20 million, almost $20 million board of education building that's going to be helped out by the county. So the county is going to assist in building a $20 million board of education building. We still have trailers in the back of schools. We still have kids and teachers learning in trailers, temporary things that should not have been there that are, again, are unsafe. I'm asking if the county can start withdrawing money that is not mandated to the school until we make our schools safe, until we get our kids out of these unsafe environments, these non-learning environments of, you know, um, temporary trailers and make sure that we get these law enforcement officers into the schools so that every single school has one. It's not happening. Our schools aren't safe. Our kids aren't safe. Our staff members there are not safe, and they should be safe. And the county's kind of helping it by just giving them money and them not being accountable for it. There's no reason why we should be building a $20 million building when we don't have kids in school. You know, if, 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 the, if the trailers are good enough for the kids, we can buy a cornfield for a lot cheaper than $20 million, take these trailers, put them in a cornfield, and congratulations, there's your new Board of Education building. They can work in that. If that's good enough for the kids and these teachers, that's good enough for these, these Board of Education people to sit in, the, in there where they don't really have any issues. There's never really been any attacks on Board of Education buildings like there's been in the history of the U.S. in school attacks. So that's my question. That's my concern. I really hope you guys look into it. I really hope we really look into what we're actually funding. I understand there is mandated funding. But please look into the funding that's not mandated until they start meeting the concerns of parents, the concerns of educators to make our schools safe once and for all. And not just let stuff get back on the back burner of, oh, Uvalde happened. We'll fix it. Sandy Hook, Columbine. I mean, you can keep going and going and going. I have stats of it. It's horrible. Since 17, 1764, 17, it predates America's independence when the first school shooting was. And yet we still have problems and we still have unsafe schools. So thank you for your time. I appreciate what you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. That's all that have signed up. Bruce? Uh, nothing more. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Okay. We'll close press and public comment. <clears throat> All right, commissioners, we can move into the uh, presentations portion of our meeting this evening. And first up, we have Director Kathy Willis, Community Services, with her update and her team. So, Kathy and company, please come on up. You can introduce your team. And we have um, 
a presentation in your books, commissioners, under tab six, item one, and I do believe it's also going to be on the. We have a presentation, or no? Kathy, do you have a presentation for the screen? Or no? uh, I thought the brochure would be on there. Okay. If it's not, that's fine. All right. Okay. Um, each of you received, good evening, each of you received, good um, annually we come in um, for our previous fiscal year update. And before I get into that, I'd just like to introduce my team members. Um, Mike Clark, who is Chief of Housing and Family Services. Annie Sparks, who is Chief of Aging and Transportation. And a few of my division leaders, I have Stacy Voorhees, who is the Senior Center Administrator, and Steve Palmer, who is the Transit Administrator. It, I'm just gonna move that a little bit more in front of you. Thank you. Yep. So, um, what you have in there is a copy of our new annual report that completed FY22. So there are multiple statistics in here which will go out to the community. We'll distribute these out to the community and, and um, local doctor's offices, um, healthcare facilities, anywhere, um, senior housing, anywhere that people might be able to see this and need more, further assistance and could come to us for such assistance. So this one basically is an overview of all of the divisions of the Department of Community Services. You like your picture, don't you? <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> Commissioner Duvenel. That had been a better choice. <laughs> oh, no, I think that's a good one. <laughs> I think well, that's a great choice. It's the hairnet that really does it. <laughs> yeah. get that up on the screen for us. Please. Which we, we do really appreciate the fact that you come to our events. And, um, and it's very exciting to the, the senior citizens of the county to have you there and it's supporting them. It makes a big difference. So we appreciate that very much. Um, many of the facts are about our regular programming as, as well as some of our COVID funding that we've been spending over the past three years. With the um, ending of the disaster declaration coming in May of this year, we have to be sure that any remaining funds are designated and prepared to be spent so that then we'll have a time where we can spend them. If they're not designated, and um, we may not be able to spend any more of them. So hopefully with just a small amount left. And when we say small, um, we probably have about a million left to spend, but we s overall have received 6.4 million. So that's something that we'll, we'll go into detail more so in our next update to show you what we've actually done with all that funding. Because through the recent legislative um, hearings, one of the things that the Maryland Department of Aging has put out that there's many counties across the state who haven't touched barely a quarter of their funding and they're not spent. I'm not sure why, um, but I think we've done a very good job of spending all that, identifying the most needy um, individuals, programs that need this service, and that's why we were able to bolster all of those programs. So, so, so Kathy, so you're saying that they haven't spent it. Is there, is there a clawback feature on this money uh, at all? Literally, if you don't have it designated and, and what you have to have is, is the plan and have it approved by the state agency, whichever state agency it's coming from, um, even though they're federal funds being channeled through the state agency. If you don't have a plan for them, in effect, um, they will be returned. The funding will be returned. And I would assume that after the May 11th deadline, even the funding that we have designated will have a time limit to be spent. Some of these have been very challenging. Our last remaining funds, three quarters of which remain in transit, have been quite difficult to spend due to all of the federal regulations in order to just even get, and especially with vehicles right now for our buses, the state contracts aren't out yet. Um, there's new pricing, the prices went up. So when we originally designated the funding, we were looking at purchasing three buses. We'll probably be lucky to get two now. Um, things like the bus, the whole bus camera system trying to get all of that in. And, and we have had very gracious partners locally to help us with that, the IT department and public works on other things. I think the only thing we have right now is a new tire changer, correct? So the public works facility has a new tire changer that accommodates our buses, the size of our buses, so because they were special sizing, so. And you were able to purchase that for? Yes. For the DPW? We did get that, but we have a, a large bucket left that's 
already planned and and accepted as where we're going to spend it on, but getting it actually spent um, has been has been quite an endeavor, um, rather difficult. The Department of Aging hasn't been so hard, and Housing and Community Services, you know, Mike's flown through all that emergency <laughs> rental assistance money, <laughs> which leads us into a few future concerns because a lot of the money was designated towards food um, in aging, and now we're coming to the end of this declaration. There's also a state change through DHR where food stamps are dropping. So the average senior right now has been receiving $300 a month in food stamps due to COVID. And as of March 1st, they go back to $23 a month. So that is a big, big drop. It's what they're used to three years prior. It was always a very small amount, but you give folks three years at $300 a month, you get accustomed to that. And that's when we worry about people choosing food over their medications. So, um, I do know this state is, is reconvening their um, food emergency committees that we had in the beginning of COVID, but this is because COVID's ending, so it's kind of ironic, but we'll, um, we'll drum up services and, and meet the needs as best we can in the future. What percentage so. would you say the seniors are getting the food stamps? That is a good question that I half, probably couldn't. Quarter, mm, a lot. Probably not half. I would say it would be a smaller amount. An opt-in, right? And it, yes, and it all, all goes through um, social services here in the county. So, um, but I would say for our our population that we're dealing with, um, you know, maybe a quarter of the population would receive them because they are income-based. Um, unfortunately, we have a higher income base in the county. So, um, but it's very very important to those who have it. So anytime somebody gets used to something and then you take it away, um, that doesn't work out very well. So, um, and also in regards to that, one of a couple of the exciting things that, that we're thrilled about with the end of COVID is returning to in-person services. Um, Mike was fortunate enough to have his first Make a Difference Day in person last year. Um, last calendar year, which I'm not sure if you know how many people you had, but it was a big event. <clears throat> I do know that, but I can't remember. Um, where everybody came to, we were back at the middle school? Yes, Southern, Southern Middle, Southern, middle right? School. Southern back Southern middle in person. School. I think we had over 100, 120. Mm -hmm. So that was very good. And the aging side is planning for the first senior summit in person again since 2019. 2019. The largest participation we had there was 500. I can't remember what year. So we usually tend to have a, a large turnout. Um, of course, it's better with good weather. So we're all praying for good weather on May 19th. Is that going to be at 4 H Park again? Yes, sir. So you will receive invitations. The flyers have gone out. Vendors are, are coming in and um, renting their spaces. So everything is well underway and everybody's very excited. And Annie will have her special spirit week. That's if, right. If you'd like to tell oh, them we'll about that. To. Thank you for that segue. <laughs> we have Monday, May 15th is PJ Day. Tuesday, May 16th, Crazy Hat and Sock Day. Wednesday, May 17th, Patriotic Day. Thursday, May 18th, Sports Day. And then at the 4-H Park on Friday, May 19th is Mardi Gras Day from 9 to 2. Um, food, fun, um, and festivities. So we do hope to see all of you there and everyone watching this. We hope to see you there as well. It's a, our biggest resource fair for aging adults, individuals with disabilities, and caregivers alike. So it's a big so day. So PJ Day is the first day? <laughs> Monday, of course. We're going to have a bunch of seniors running around in their pajamas. <laughs> you will. I might show up for that one. <laughs> Typically, the county offices join in this also, so don't be frightened if you walk in any of your county offices on that day. They may be wearing PJs. <laughs> Hopefully appropriate. So we're back to COVID, basically. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> no, this was going on way before COVID. This is Annie's show. So. But I'm saying it wouldn't be unusual now to see that after COVID, post COVID. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. Right. So. Well, you have to admit some of these pajamas are pretty stylish. So. True. Anyway, sorry. Sure. Oh, that's great. So that's exciting. We're looking forward to that. 
And also one of the, the larger things that happened most recently was um, Ride for Free that started on January 3rd, 2023. And um, we were very excited. Um, Jim was there with us that day for the ribbon cutting. And we have all public route fixed, deviated fixed routes um, riding for free, no fares. The door-to-door -door service, demand, response, more medical and um, other needs. Transportation is free as well. Um, Steve, the um, transit administrator, has informed us that ridership has increased by 20% in the first month. This is something that we followed in the footsteps of Montgomery County, PG, and I believe Charles. Um, and it's gone very well. Uh, we noticed a large decline after COVID of folks using the buses. So since Steve has come in, he's done a very good job of, of managing the routes, changing th some things around, making it more accessible, uh, safer stops, and reconfiguring some of the, the routes that needed it the most. So Did you guys get that? Did you see this? I did. It's wonderful. You did? Yes. And you and shared it with your, it's, your drivers? It's very good. Posted in Congratulations. The we like to get letters like that. It's very rare that we do get letters like that. So <laughs> when we get them, I share them everywhere. <laughs> That's so. good, though. Is that Chris's handwriting? <laughs> <laughs> no. My so. handwriting can't read. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ride for free in 23, mm -hmm. right? Is mm -hmm. that the slogan? Yes. So it's very exciting. Um, the, the individuals using the service are very pleased. So um, that's about all I have. Oh, except for one other thing. Um, the Queen Anne's County Family YMCA and Active Aging Center, of course, as you can see when you ride by, is well on its way. Uh, we are looking forward to getting services open, hopefully, in there by the fall, hopefully October, with the delivery of a transformer would be very helpful. <laughs> We're still waiting on the transformer still, huh? Right. Well, wow. uh, the good news is it went from December, from December arrival back to July arrival. So hmm. that puts us back on track. All, all bearing dates go well. So um, the <clears throat> senior center administrator and staff are working with the YMCA staff now on programming and looking forward to getting everything that we can in there with our designated shared spaces. Annie and I took a nice hard hat tour recently and um, laid out where all of our services will be. And even some of our staff will be in what the YMCA likes to call a bullpen area, where they put staff so staff aren't too comfortable to sit too long because the YMCA is active and you want to be out and in the crowds. And um, so we have a lot of opportunity with that. We're looking very much forward to that. So. Any questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Thank you all. Great presentation. Yeah. Good. All right, commissioners. Our next presenter is Mr. Steve Chanley with his uh, Parks and Recreation update. So again, if you want to turn to tab number six, item two, pages four through twenty, and. Uh, Steve does have a present his presentation up on the screen as well. Every time he comes here, he wants more. Inspector <laughs> Chanley, how you doing? Good evening. So, uh, got a quick little update for you. Um, tried to change it up a little bit instead of having individual slides on everything. Um, trying to combine a couple of things, which you just didn't explain. So some of the, the tasks that we've been able to complete for, uh, for parks is uh, we got Graysonville parking lot uh, repaved and, um, and striped. Uh, we did repairs to Southernville and Route 18 Park. We also paved the Fallen Heroes uh, parking lot. Um, so that has you know, been a tremendous help. It's, you know, it's very active. We get a lot of people that stop by there, not only to, to view the memorial, but also just to either access the trail or just to sit and have, uh, have lunch. Um, in regards to fields, we've uh, completed our sports fertilization uh, for our fields. We've done overseeding. Uh, we've had a very successful ranger program this year. We've got two full-time uh, staff, but we also were able to uh, get 11 part-time staff this year, and they were um, spectacular. Um, and again, like I said, I'm just trying to put up a couple of pictures and, and talk about them. 
Uh, the, the first one to your left is uh, the pickleball courts. Pickleball continues to grow and blow up bigger and bigger. Uh, we're in the process of getting a, um, uh, the court up in um, uh, Round Top Park. That should be constructed early this spring. Uh, we're still in the process of planning our fireworks um, down at um, the Kent Narrows. A little bit of a, a change in there. We're still going to fire them off from Ferry Point, but we'll have everybody convene in um, Jamal's parking lot. We'll have a couple of food trucks there and probably a DJ. So we'll because of all the work that's because of the be construction that's coming up. Um, okay. That bid just went out um, from DPW. Um, they're planning to have a notice to proceed with work on uh, April 18th. It's going to be about I think six to eight weeks or uh, no, six months. Six six months. So it'll go clear work. to knocking on the door of November. Um, yeah, probably so. Okay, probably so. Um, and that actually works out well because the planting is the last part of it and we wanted to make sure that the planting was done in, in late fall as opposed to late July. Um, and what about the use session. of the Heritage Center? How's that going to affect groups that meet there? Have we thought um, about that? That is going to be Heather's. Okay. <clears throat> and you're working with Heather? We're working with that. Okay. And, and talking to Heather too, they're working through a lot of that right now, getting the logistics of that done. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Um, again, because really tomorrow's March 1st, we're all prepared for ball fields. Uh, we've got the high schools ready and our park fields um, ready for spring play. Uh, down at the bottom left, we're uh, still in the process of changing over our uh, trash cans from the steel containers to uh, the plastic totes. Um, we did that for two reasons. One, because the, the steel containers were only 50 gallons. These are 96 gallon uh, containers and we also have a lift um, that attaches to the truck that picks them up, so therefore it's not a manual process. Um, the next picture over is um, we did some tree planting at Mowbray Park along um, uh, the roadway and the pickleball courts. Um, also some other tree planting we did uh, was down at Conquest, um, down by the, um, the, the baseball field, softball field there. Um, uh, about 12 to 15 trees were infected with uh, the emerald ash borer. We had to take those out and then we replanted some trees there. And then the final picture off is uh, the Churchill Park um, artificial turf one. That's just a rendering of it, but the um, same pro process is going on down at Bats Neck as well. Um, they're moving right along. What's the time frame on that? Um, Bats Neck has finished the stone. They have the carpet, so they're getting ready to, to lay that. Um, and Churchill is probably, I think they said about two weeks behind, three weeks behind maybe. So it'll be ready for fall youth football? Oh, it'll be ready probably by May. Okay. That's, that's our plan <coughs> is to have it ready by May. So um, we've got people, you know, getting ready to, um, to, to utilize them. Thanks for uh, addressing that sure. resident's concern about the church oh, lights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No problem. So the American Ram Company, this is the company that we've uh, contracted out to do the skate park. Um, and part of the, the skate park thing we wanted them to do was to um, do community outreach to find out what the kids want. And Well, I shouldn't say kids because if you look at the, <laughs> I have the demographics of, of who's uh, my neighbor's interested up. in that. He's a grown man and he can't wait for that thing. I think it's probably come. a lot of people my age who were, when they were kids were skating and they can't yeah. wait to recapture their youth, right? So in, in a one week's time. Yes, up there. We're going to have to have somebody <laughs> on standby. We're going to have to have an ambulance there. <laughs> so the survey was out for one week. Uh, from Friday the 17th to Friday the 24th. We got a total of 335 responses. On the 17th, the day that it went out, we had 247 responses. And the demographics <laughs> go from um, 12 to 18 year olds, we had 68, uh, 68 uh, uh, survey respondents. 19 to 30, we had 106. From 31 to 49, we had 121. <laughs> And, and it gets even better than 50. How many times did you respond? <laughs> 50, and over, small ramps <laughs> 50 and over, we have 32. Wow. So we got a Say nice that again. One. 50 and over age group, we had 32 respondents. So. There'll be a couple of ramps with little, little bars on the side. I'm going to go and watch, <laughs> that's for sure. So the, the point being is, you know, this is going to be a project that really has a lot of community involvement and hopefully we'll be able to get the majority of what people want. Um, so we're looking for. So real forward. quick, Steve, can I play the devil's advocate? Any any comments that came back regarding the location of it? Um, there has been other other inquiries made to us on on that, um, 
as far as this survey, this was two people who are interested in having the, the ones that uh, responded to it. They like it. Okay. They're they're positive about the about the location of it. And and if I'm and so if if I'm right, it's that that property um, that butts up against Love Point Road there behind Amalfi Coast, the restaurant. Uh, no, it's it's all the way back. So it's the the property directly across from. Um, uh, the business park the entrance to the business park right and, um, adjacent to cocky lane it's okay a small triangle right, but you would access it, i think you're saying you have to access, access it through, through behind cocky, cocky. Yeah. okay by the bank uh yes yes yeah. yes um recreation um our sport spring sport leagues are beginning but to, uh, i'm sure you're aware that this was attempted at one time by the county and it it didn't go well right because it was it was vandalized right but I, I that location that. was not ideal and they were movable correct they were wooden or partially wood and cement this is fixated correct. so it's not like you can pick it up and and steal it no so so i can address i can address that because strangely enough i was here um 20 years ago and um as a recreation uh manager at that time the skate park was one of my responsibilities or or my headaches at the time and and part of it was is because it was secluded and there was you know it was hidden back there you know people are left alone you know to their own devices so this is a very um open area and, and you also have to think that um you know you have to give people the benefit of the doubt that the skate culture has changed you know and, and i think the, it being an olympic sport has truly helped that and, and brought in not only a new bunch of users but also an older age demographic have gotten older and hopefully gotten older so um, yes you're you're absolutely right got my tony hawk t-shirt ready the ribbon cutting we'll be ready get your go. black and white checkered vans right. <laughs> so uh Continuing on, we've got beach volleyball that's going on up at Old Love Point in Southernsville Park. We've got an adult league also there at uh, Old Love Point Park. Uh, we did a, a combination program with Animal Services. Uh, it was supposed to be the weekend of um, Valentine's Day, but it rained. We postponed it to the 18th. It was called Pulling in Love. It was a um, kind of a, a fun run walk with your dog at Terrapin Park. Um, there was about 50 some folks that were registered for that program so that turned out uh, turned out really great and really great working with people as my staff is really happy with that and we're probably going to be doing more too so <laughs> um, we're in the process of hiring uh, recreation leaders for our summer program and we have an upcoming bus trip to um, the flower show in philadelphia in are you March. how are you reaching out to the the part-time summer help are you you posting at the high schools it's advertised through um through our natural um hr um, avenues uh we also had a contact with uh someone who has i can't remember how it is but they have access to the school guidance counselors okay and put the information out that way okay uh, and also returning staff as well one of our big programs that we started last year was the bash by the bay which is a baseball tournament um july 15th and 16th and i know you're probably short on time Am, am I okay? Okay. Okay. So last year we had a, a baseball tournament um, at, uh, at Route 18 and um, White Marsh. So we're continuing on. We've increased the age groups uh, 12U, 13U, and 14U. We've got two teams in 12U, um, six teams in 13U, and eight teams in 14U. So that's um, already so far up. signed up. So far signed up. Uh, so I will put a, a, a little plug out there. I'm hoping that some of the local travel teams here will go ahead and join up and, and participate in this program. Um, you know, as we support them in their programs, we're hoping that we'll get some reciprocal um, benefits uh, to that as well. So I'll so, play that guilt card again this you. year. <laughs> so that, um, that, that tournament, mm -hmm. you know, with two teams, four teams, six teams, plus parents, right. talking to a couple hundred people. Easily, easily. Spending money in, in the the restaurants and the hotels and the gas stations and i will say not necessarily hotels because most of the teams are within like an hour hour and a half drive away baseball sometimes becomes you know you know you're going to travel for the day and come back very but good you know but you the got the lunch and dinner and all that kind of stuff that takes place with that very good for the local economy yeah it's a it's a benefit Although it's a small scale it's it's great right and we get a lot of compliments on that 
Um, but you can see the three sites that we're using. We're using Route 18 Park, White Marsh Park, and also Queen Anne's County High School um, for that as well. So it'd be nice if you had all that stuff kind of together in one space. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, summer camps, you know, registration has already started and it will start the week right after school. Uh, so we've got programs, um, summer days camp, uh, which is for individuals with disabilities, six to 21 year olds that we service, um, and then discover uh, summer camp for six to 12 year olds. And those are the four sites, uh, Churchill, Graysonville, and Kennard and Mowbray. Um, we've done the Conquest Preserve Trail Run. We did a 5K and a 10K. Um, it's getting more and more popular each year. We've done it the past two years, so um, it's a great way to bring people out to, uh, to that facility. Again, you can see the numbers for our flag football, basketball, and field hockey. You know, all those uh, fall and winter sports are, um, have, have ended and we're continuing on. Public landings, um, the fishing pier, we, uh, <laughs> you know, we have Clevis Mulchum, which is a restroom type facility, and we've had to do some, some maintenance on that to you know, get it back up to uh, a good operating standard. Um, staff has been replacing uh, wooden benches. Um, they replaced a, a, a wing wall that was damaged by a motorist. It was a little bit flooded, and the person didn't see it and ended up hitting it. Uh, again, we made those repairs on that. Um, comes out of um, you know, our, our budget for that. Uh, that's an unforeseen expense. You don't expect that to happen. Uh, and also we're dealing with abandoned and derelict boats. Uh, there, was, there was a sunken boat at Goodhands Creek and we removed that uh, relatively quickly. Um, we've contacted a few other owners about their derelict boats. I actually had someone mention that to me the other day that there was an abandoned boat like Thompson's Creek Road. Right, right. And we're, we're well aware of that one. They should call you. Um, we've already been in contact with those folks. In fact, Commissioner Corcorino can definitely address that as that's my next bullet point. He uh, met with the citizens from Thompson Creek um, uh, virtually on the 19th and then, I'm sorry, um, yeah, virtually on the 19th and in person on the 23rd um, to address their concerns and see what we can or we, what we cannot do. Uh, again, as I mentioned with our park rangers, again, we're getting them more and more educated. They're going to be enrolled in the, uh, a matur master naturalist um, uh, program. Um, it'll be once a month from March into December. Um, and they'll be working with our recreation staff to provide programs as well, which brings me up to their um, brochure that they uh, put together, a listing of the programs that they're going to be doing. Uh, we put that out at a couple of different places. And again, this is uh, just growing this program, getting more and more activities underneath. Baybridge Airport there uh, ran into a little bit of difficulties due to um, uh, getting materials. They were expected to start um, in the spring of 23, but now it looks like it's going to be the fall of 23. Um, commercial hangar is undergoing uh, some renovations. They've worked with DPW on that. And they're also in the process of getting a lease on a, a a fuel truck. Um, it's a lease on a 2003 truck, but that's actually an improvement because they were used on a 1977 truck. So, um, I'm sure, that's perfectly safe. So again, we got our money's worth out of <laughs> out of that one. Historic. Um, hangers are, are remain full, and there's a long wait list. Um, fuel sales remain steady, um, and then we've got a new company, um, Hydra Avionic Solutions, um, is planning to start up in uh, the late spring or early summer. Blue Heron, um, they've got their uh, green renovation, the capital project that you guys approved earlier this year, um, actually started on Monday. Um, the maintenance building is scheduled to be recited and completed next month. Again, that was you know, uh, a neighbor's concern that has been brought up over the course of time. We've taken care of that, or we're taking care of that. We did some um, cleaning out of some old um, trees and dead bushes and getting that cleaned up, ready to go. We've got new golf carts. Um, and we've been busy with this uh, great winter weather, so uh, we're taking advantage of that. And we just discovered that there was a sinkhole, and we'll be working with DPW and their contractor to take a look at it to see if we can resolve that issue. What happens to the old golf carts? Do we, le do we lease the new ones? Do we lease them or we actually? Carts? Yeah. We lease them. We lease them. Yes. Okay, so let's go. Yep. And that is it. Perfect. Good job. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for Steve while he's here? Well, he's over here for a little bit, but we're good? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. All right. You. Great. All right, Commissioners, we're just a little behind schedule, but we do have a public hearing scheduled now. That's our next um, item. So in your book under tab seven, 
we have um, that information on pages one through four. So I'd ask for uh, Thompson to come down so he can um, read the public notice. And this is um, a follow-up to the informational meeting we had last meeting. And this is the comprehensive water and sewer plan amendment hearing for the town of Queenstown, their potable water system enhancements, and Northwest Chester Water Main Extension project that uh, Department of Public Works is working on currently. So, Mr. Thompson. Ready? This public hearing being held by the County Commissioner of Queen Anne's County, 6.05 p.m. Tuesday, February 28, 2023, in the County Commissioner's meeting room located in the Liberty Building, 107 North Liberty Street, Central Maryland. The purpose of the hearing is, is to consider two amendments to the Queen Anne's County 2011 Comprehensive Water and Sewage Plan in addition to this hearing, an informational presentation was made at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, February 14th, also in the commission meeting room. Copies of the proposed amendments have been available at the Office of the County Commissioners and uh, obtainable electronically by request to Allen Quimby at QAC.org. All hearing sites are accessible to individuals with disabilities, sign language interpreters, and assistive listening systems are available. Persons who wish to comment on the proposed amendments may do so at this hearing. Speakers will be limited to three minutes each. Written te testimony of any length may be submitted on or before the hearing date to the Director of Public Works, 312 Safety Drive, Cedarville. The First Amendment is the Town of Queenstown Potable Water System Enhancement this is a text amendment to reflect the town plan to improve their existing water system by taking the following actions. Refurbishment of the existing 50,000 gallon elevated tank located on Wall Street. Installation of a new 100,000 gallon, gallon ground storage tank located adjacent to the existing Queenstown outlets properties elevated tank. <clears throat> Construct a new forage well into the Matawan Aquifer and a new water treatment facility located on Del Road Avenue. Replace undersized and or defective water mains to meet the provisions of the 10 state standards to all areas in the Queenstown service area and extend new water mains to recently annexed areas. In addition to new groundwater appropriation for the Del Road Avenue well, Town seeks to increase the groundwater appropriation permit for the two existing wells currently in the Matawan Aquifer. <clears throat> then we'll seek to replace the previously approved amendment in, in its entirety, which was noted as Amendment 1112, as far as that uh, amendment addressed the Town of Queenstown's water system. Any public comment with respect to the we didn't have anybody sign up, Patrick. No. <clears throat> any, other, any public comment? All right. Bruce, nobody? Okay. Uh, the second request is Northwest Chester Water Main Extension. This is a map amendment to reflect the County Commission intent to extend an eight inch water main from the intersection of Main Street and Cass Marina Road adjacent to the Chester McDonald's west along Main Street to Shopping Center Road. The intent of this amendment is to upgrade the water, water sewers area map designations from W3 to W2 to allow the properties along that route to connect to water when they so desire. A public comment with respect to the Chester, Northwest Chester Water Main Extension. Nothing. None. Okay. Um, we'll hold this open for two more weeks. Okay. Right, Mr. Jim Adams should be back from assignment. Did you want ready? Right. Thank you. All right, so we'll hold the record open for two weeks and vote on those amendments at our uh, March 14th meeting. Okay. All right, commissioners, we're back to presentations. So next up, we have Mr. Ward Slakem, the executive director of the Oyster Recovery Partnership. 
He's going to give us an update on the Oyster Recovery Program. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and, and provide this update. Yeah, thank you. And again, tab six, back to tab six, item three, pages 21 through 35. Uh, oh, excuse me, on your desk, uh, the, the uh, presentation was updated from uh, what was submitted last week. So the updated presentation is on the screen and also on your desk here. All right, take it away, Ward. Thank you very much. Extras, so that's okay. Um, well, thanks again for the opportunity to provide you this update. Uh, I will stress uh, up front that uh, uh, Oyster Recovery Partnership isn't necessarily affiliated with the Department of Natural Resources or the state. We're a, we're a nonprofit, and um, <clears throat> we do a lot of work with the state of Maryland. Um, I figured I would provide an update on, on really who we are and just sort of go, go through that quickly. Uh, as I said, we're, we're a nonprofit. We were uh, established in 1994. <clears throat> Our mission is to lead the conservation um, uh, efforts of the native oyster and promote the economic and ecological value of oysters. We do that through working with the state of Maryland and others to really promote um, opportunities in the public fish fishery to enhance public fishing grounds, but also to basically put oysters in sanctuaries where they can be protected and thrive and, and reproduce. We also work in, in areas um, where we're conserving shell. shell. Oyster shell is a big component of both the public fishing grounds and also the, the restoration work that we do in, in sanctuaries. And, uh, and then finally, you know, our organization really promotes sustainable fisheries practices. Uh, we are funded a lot by the state of Maryland and also federal grants and by foundations. So we do have a very strong and long-standing relationship with the state of Maryland. What I really wanted to do was to give you an update on, uh, on several initiatives that are related to ongoing oyster recovery efforts. Uh, one of those initiatives is specific to the Chesapeake Bay wide. And then <clears throat> I wanted to talk about two other projects that are occurring in Queen Anne's County and specifically in Eastern Bay. Uh, the first project, <clears throat> sorry, the first initiative that I wanted to, to talk about was um, an initiative that ORP has been coordinating since 2015. It, it is basically, it's related to the use and the recommendation that oysters actually have a significant role in the removal of nutrients in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about uh, what's, what we call as the Oyster Best, Man uh, Oyster Best Management Practice Expert Panel. And so this initiative is specific to uh, EPA and specific to the total maximum daily load. So that is the amount of, of nutrients and sediments that actually are introduced into, the, into our waterways. The EPA manages those nutrients and, and they manage the process to restore the bay. ORP has been managing um, a, a group of experts to evaluate whether uh, oysters could be approved as a best management practice. So uh, to give you an example, best management practice is like a cover crop that's used by, by farmers to basically reduce the amount of nutrients that actually are entering into the waterway. And by doing that, they're actually <clears throat> able to use that cover crop as a BMP within the county uh, watershed implementation uh, plans. So we have been managing this uh, group of experts and to establish a new BMP, you actually have to convene a group of experts to evaluate whether there's sufficient information or data to suggest that you can recommend a new BMP. So since 2015, we've been managing this group of ex experts, um, and they have evaluated uh, in 2016, they recommended that oysters be approved as a BMP for use in aquaculture. I'll get into that specifically, so oyster aquaculture and we have continued with this panel of experts and they have recently um, recommended that oysters that are produced and used as new oysters in, um, in the public fishery and also in restoration, uh, they're recommending that those also be used or be approved as BMPs. So part of the panel process was once they determined whether that information is sufficient uh, to make the recommendation, they also then have to establish the rates of removal of nitrogen and phosphorus um, that oysters provide, so that way it can be accounted for uh, under the TMDL. <clears throat> In addition to that, 
the panel is charged with recommending verification protocols. They're not just going to recommend a rate, they're also going to recommend ways that you can evaluate and quantify how much nutrients um, are actually removed by a specific BMP. Uh, in this case, um, the, the recommendation was based upon new biomass of oysters that might be produced in the, in the restoration or in the, the public fishery. There's a process that we use at Oyster Recovery Partnership that to produce new oysters, we work with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, their oyster hatchery down in Cambridge, where we're actually producing new oysters and we put them on shell, it's called spat on shell. That goes out and that's planted within either the public fishery or the sanctuary. Those constitute new oysters that would not be there if this process didn't happen. Do you put them in the same location every time? No, we have a, a pretty robust process where we're evaluating uh, historic oyster habitat and we're going and we're putting those oysters on areas that we knew historically would have uh, produced oysters and good for growth. And, and that's in the sanctuaries in the context of the public fishery. We work directly with uh, county oyster committees with Department of Natural Resources to identify harvest bars where that might be those bars over time that, the, that they uh, harvested from. And so it doesn't always go back down on the same place, but it can, and specifically like in the public harvest context where they may have removed oysters and we want to replace those oysters. So in terms of the BMP, I don't want to get too technical. There are some details. There's a, there's a report that's currently out, which is the recommendation from the panel uh, to recommend uh, harvest uh, as a BMP and also the restoration practice as a BMP. What's up on this slide uh, are essentially what we're terming as our, our oyster BMP toolkit. Uh, this, is, this is really new uh, for the EPA to actually Recommend or evaluate and, and potentially approve an in-water BMP. So this is a new um, paradigm, if, if you will, for the Chesapeake Bay and the EPA to consider BMPs that are actually in water and also living organisms. Um, going from left to right, if you look at number one, um, as I said, the, the panel already recommended oyster aquaculture uh, as a potential BMP and they were and the EPA approved it and so what that means is if I'm growing a new oyster in the water and I remove that from harvest well there's nitrogen and phosphorus that's contained in the tissue and the science suggests that we know how much in the tissue of that shell so once you remove that oyster you're also removing that nitrogen and phosphorus from the bay because eventually that oyster will be consumed so oysters in aquaculture have been approved as a BMP. And the customers are eating the nitrogen and the phosphorus. Yes. Yeah. Nitrogen, uh, nitrogen in, in particular is a building block for, for human cell development. So we're also eating nitrogen and it's helping us build our cells. Um, so um, that's already been approved. And that's something that could be taken advantage of at the county level. Uh, there is aquaculture that's occurring within Eastern Bay and, and, and Queen Anne County waters, and we're promoting that. It, it actually hasn't been taken advantage of up to this point. Um, but the, the other uh, BMPs that are being recommended uh, actually will, um, in our mind, they will probably provide greater amounts of nitrogen in particular to be removed from the bay, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Number two, so moving from left to right, number two up here on the screen is harvest assimilation. That's just those new oysters uh, that have been deployed in, in the public fishing grounds that could be harvested. Those oysters are also being recommended as a BMP. And going down to number three, um, and I apologize for this, uh, that there is a, a typo in this, um, in that um, we're recommending new oysters that go down for in restoration, so putting new oysters down on the bottom, they're going to accrue new biomass that biomass is sequestering nitrogen and phosphorus in the tissue, but it's also doing it in the shell. And because that shell's not removed, um, that shell is also uh, sequestering nitrogen and phosphorus. So that should be on here. It should be amount of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in tissue and shell. And, um, and then the other typo was that it's not harvested from the restoration context. If you look it down at that bottom bullet, that was just a cut and paste typo error. 
So those oysters are remaining in the water. They're, they're sequestering nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and then moving over to the, the restoration, denitrification, there's a few typos there, but I'll just stress <coughs> this is going to be by far the BMP, if approved, because it's now being evaluated by EPA, they haven't approved it. Um, the denitrification process uh, at the oyster reef level in the restoration context is going to have the potential to remove significant amounts of nitrogen um, in the bay if it's approved. There is a report out. I mentioned the report was submitted to EPA for recommendation for these um, specific BMPs, um, and it's still uh, under review. And so if there are any county representatives that want to review this and consider how this might fit into uh, the county's goals for, for um, nutrient removal um, in your waterways, I would um, suggest that you, you, know, you, you get your folks to look at it, and I'd be happy to, to help review that. I don't know where I am on time, so I'm just going to continue to have a few other updates. These two other updates are specific to Queen Anne County uh, and, and Eastern Bay, and one of them is an initiative that the commissioners actually provided a letter of support for to ORP. We were awarded a, a, um, a contract from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, and that is the, the Eastern Bay project to develop a framework for future oyster resource expansion. And um, this, this project itself is, um, is really, I think, aspirational. We're, we're hoping that we can work together with all of the key stakeholders, both the public fishery aquaculture and those folks who practice restoration to develop a plan for future um, you know, restoration of oysters and production of oysters in Eastern Bay. Um, and then basically that plan would, would, uh, would be, allow us to work together. And so that way we can foster you know, resource sharing and, and goals and initiatives. The project itself was something that the Department of Natural Resources um, identified as a priority. So there's a lot, there is uh, some significant funding that is being directed towards Eastern Bay for both public fishery and also sanctuary um, expansion. Um, and this just slide sort of just shows that our goal is to really in, uh, engage stakeholders within Queen Anne's County um, to, to help us develop this plan. That way it fosters support and uh, allows us to continue the work in Eastern Bay for, to the future. The slide just goes over the major stakeholders, um, identifies that there are historical challenges, um, there are, you know, basically uh, limited resources. Uh, sometimes there's not agreement on the value of a sanctuary or the value of the public fishery. We're hoping that we can break down those barriers and work together, you know, as a group to basically establish what, I'm, what we're calling uh, a framework for uh, future oyster production. Uh, the outcomes of this project are expected to be a comprehensive restoration and management strategic plan for Eastern Bay, and, and essentially, as a framework, we would hope that that would apply to uh, to other waterways that might adopt a similar approach. And also, there's some mapping and some bottom assessments that will be ongoing. Uh, those might be used to at least promote and recommend updates of oyster maps within the bay, uh, and then again, develop a framework. Uh, and, and work really with some local uh, watershed stewards. And in this case, we're partnering up with the Chesapeake um, CBEC, so the Chesapeake Environmental Center. They're, they're a partner on this project. And then lastly, I'll draw attention to a, a program that uh, Oyster Recovery Partnership developed. It's called uh, Build a Reef. And the Build a Reef project is really designed to try to establish additional support for oyster recovery, not necessarily just in sanctuaries, but that's where it's currently operational. And what we're hoping to do as an organization is move beyond uh, the dependence of state funding and other um, you know, public funding and, and really reach out to private corporations and foundations and even the public directly to, um, to engage them in the initiative of uh, restoring oysters, in particular within sanctuaries, especially if it comes from individuals. In this case, we're planning to do a build a reef planting this uh, summer, actually in June 
of this year <coughs> where we partnered with Shore River. That's the local steward in the area. Um, and we're hoping that you know, we're going to be able to do one specific planting, which could be upwards of <coughs> 20 million juvenile oysters going in the bay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but that's, <coughs> that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you. How many reefs are in the Eastern Bay? How many reefs? Yeah, man-made. There are hundreds of acres of, I don't know individually, but there's hundreds of acres of oyster habitat contained within the sanctuaries of Eastern Bay. And not just the bay itself, that would include the Y River or the Miles River. Um, so there's quite a lot of habitat within Eastern Bay. Questions, anybody? <coughs> Good presentation. Very, thank, very you, thank you very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good <coughs> to see you, Mr. Slagan. Thanks again very much for your presentation. Appreciate that. Commissioners, and we are just right about on schedule. We have one final presentation before new business, and that is from Kelly Hamilton, our Chief of Animal Services, and she's going to give I believe her very first update first on update, the right? animal services Welcome. in Queen Anne's County. Yeah, so. I'm glad I can uh, that finally is, share everything with you guys. Up here. Um, tabs, tab, tab six, commissioners, uh, item number four, pages 36 through 52. It's the one with the Paul prints on it there. <laughs> That's the one. Okay, All right. so I'm here today to present our 2022 year in review. Better late than never. But here we are. So we'll talk a little bit about our animal intake for 2022. And as you can see, we're, we're not just dogs and cats. Um, that is the bulk of what we do take in from Queen Anne's County. Um, but you can see really what we're taking in the most are strays out of our community, 412 in particular, um, followed by owner surrenders. Owner surrenders are um, really for a whole different bunch of reasons. Really, an, uh, an owner may not be able to care for that animal anymore. A lot of times they're moving, allergies. Um, those are just some of the reasons that we do see that the animals are surrendered to us. Returned adoptions, as our contract reads, we take back any animal that we've ever adopted out, regardless of time. If it's been, you know, three years has passed, we still take that animal back into our care. Um, and what's so, the average of when they return them? Is it, are most of those returns within a few months or are, like what's it? So, so yeah, so of those 60 um, that I'm, I'm citing right here of that year, um, about 40 to 50% of those were returned within three months of that adoption. Within how many? With, within about three months. Three months? Of the, of the adoption, yes. Um, of course, we do work closely with animal control, so we do get cases where we have seized custody. Um, and then we do transfer animals in from other shelters. Um, primarily last year, what we did is from other shelters in Maryland that needed our help that were at overcapacity. Uh, we work very closely with Montgomery County, Prince George's County, uh, and Caroline County. So in total, last year, we took in 1,029 animals. And again, we do have the breakdown of species. Like I said, we, we do um, some things other than just cats and dogs. So I'll just explain a little bit of what a, a stray intake means, since that is the bulk of, of what we do take in um, to the shelter. Basically, any animal that is found as a stray is placed on a seven-day stray hold at the shelter. And what that does, that allows for owners to come and claim that animal, it gives them time to see them out on social media, which is where we advertise um, that we do have them housed with us. Um, animals have to be given by law. Obviously, Maryland state law requires all animals to be rabies vaccinated if they are over four months old. So 16 weeks and older, they are required to have that rabies vaccine. Um, so if that owner even comes and claims that animal, if that, if that animal is not rabies vaccinated, we do have to vaccinate before we can release it back to the owner. Uh, we do have a vet on staff that can do that process two days a week, Wednesdays and Thursdays. If not, we do the best we can to outsource um, to some of our local vets uh, in the community so we can get that animal home as soon as possible. So 119 animals found their way back home through animal services in 2022. <clears throat> so what happens after seven days and nobody claims that animal? They are basically vetted fully, fully vaccinated. If they're not already altered, we spay and neuter them and then we place them up for adoption. As of 2022 in April, 
Um, animal services no longer took in feral cats. Um, this is basically thanks to everybody who um, said yes to our trap neuter release program. Um, we do still take in sick or injured feral cats out of the community so we can um, hopefully get them well. So not all animals entering the shelter stay in the, animal, uh, stay in the shelter. So obviously we have our trap neuter release program. So as of April 22nd, 2022, um, we have performed 115 TNR surgeries that closed out the year of 2022. Um, we are already hitting right around 60 so far for the two months here in 2023. So uh, trap neuter release, we perform the surgery on site at no cost to the caretaker. These animals are spayed, neutered, ear-tipped, microchipped, rabies vaccinated, and then released back to that familiar territory. They are released the same day with us through animal services. However, they are, um, the caretaker is told to keep them in that trap until the following day. This way all the anesthesia is out of their system and they can totally fend for themselves. Um, this program has actually decreased our shelter cat population by 20% since April. So TNR is obviously a great bulk of what we do, but since we have hired a uh, vet on staff, we also performed 444 other spay neuter procedures um, in 2022. Um, the majority of these uh, surgeries actually used to be outsourced before we had this, this vet on staff, which actually delayed our adoption process because all animals have to be spayed or neutered before officially being adopted. So talking about adoptions in 2022, we adopted out 601 animals. They all found their new homes. Cats are always gonna um, bring up you know, they get the gold medal for most adoptions for sure. But that chinchilla was working hard. Um, you know, he really wanted to get his home and we were able to do that. So what's great is that my staff has to be able to not only take care of the dogs and cats, but they have to have enough knowledge to take care of that turtle that comes in, that chinchilla that comes in, and even this year, the hermit crab that came in. So it really is a team effort. So. Over 70 volunteers last year uh, clocked over 1,600 volunteer hours with us, and that was up 44% since 2021. And we're very, very proud of that number. We also had 132 foster families open up their homes to 428 animals that were in need of foster care. Foster care. events of appreciation events for the volunteers and the foster May families. 7th, sir. <laughs> May 7th on Conquest Beach. Um, so fosters really can open up their home to anything from an animal that needs socialization to a medical foster or, you know, that orphan's kitten that has to be fed by a bottle. So they, they do a fantastic job for us. So hard work does pay off. Our live release rate, basically a live release rate is determined um, by the uh, ASPCA. It's a national standard. You have to have a minimum of 90% live release rate to be considered a no-kill shelter. Um, and then, of course, that equation is up top, and it really just has to do with how many of uh, the outcomes that you have, adoption, return to owner, transfer to another no-kill shelter, um, and that equals your outcome for the year. And we are very excited to say that we are at 97.6% live release rate. That is up 7.6% from 2021, and actually places us at um, really within the top 5% of the state. So why were we so successful? We are utilizing our resources, um, networking with other rescues and organizations to get these animals transferred out if possible, breed-specific rescues, again, animals that might need socialization. There's a lot of cat rescues out there that we reach out to that that's their sole purpose. Um, so we are working really well with them. We've developed really good relationships um, with our, our local animal hospitals. Um, AVEC, of course, across the bridge, and we are even utilizing now um, specialty services, ophthalmology, um, and I have a dog that's going for a neuro consult tomorrow. Um, so we're really working really, really closely with everybody. Um, medical staff, again, we, we talked about how I do have a vet on staff now. Um, that is obviously doing a tremendous job in terms of getting some diagnoses done quickly. So we are able to treat these medical conditions on the spot right away, instead of necessarily having to outsource, send lab work out to you know the laboratory, which might take three, four days to get back. We have results immediately because of the equipment that we have purchased. Um, the TNR program, again, decreased our uh, cat shelter population by 20%. And of course, they're just campaigns, um, community outreach. Um, like again, we, we just talked about how we worked with Parks and Rec. Um, so we are out there on social media doing events um, in the community. 
these were some of the events that um, we did participate in and create last year. Uh, Critter Camp really was a, a huge success, um, and we're actually going to expand it this year, so we're adding another week of Critter Camp on, so that, that is a four-day camp of ages um, 8 to 12 to come and hang at the shelter and learn everything from animal welfare, from talking to our behaviorists, to our veterinarian, to um, the canine cops coming and doing a demonstration. Um, we did photos with Santa as well. And um, one of the things that we really liked um, this year too was we did National Family Volunteer Day. So we opened up the shelter um, and invited all of our uh, volunteers to bring their family in to kind of see how, maybe why and what they're doing spending their Sundays with us, so. And, you know, again, we, we can't talk enough about our, our absolutely generous community here. Um, you know, when we put a plea out on social media, whether it's, hey, you know, we're running low on, on training treats or whatever, I mean, this community really pulls together. I mean, it's really very inspiring. Um, that one photo up there on the left, they, they did a, a fundraiser for us out of their garage in their own community. Um, you know, even the, the, the bottom middle photo there with Charlie posing in front, um, that was the Betty White Challenge, which we never even um, asked about participating in, but the community just jumped in, and all of a sudden we had 15 Amazon boxes at our doorstep. Um, everybody just wanted to help and give to their local shelter, and it really is, it, it's quite great. So we, we did a little cleanup. So we created some new office spaces. Um, Important too was the, a free room cat room, um, and that is important because you got to get these out. Dogs can go out for a walk. Dogs can get some yard time. Um, cats, it's important that they do get out of that cage and, and stretch their legs. Um, certainly is good for their well-being and their mental state. So we did create a free room cat room. We switched some things around so we can be medically more prepared. So we have a new quarantine room, new small animal room to give them some some area in the shelter where it's quiet, where they don't have to hear dogs barking. Uh, we have a new sh uh, shed for storage. Uh, again, we talked about diagnostic equipment. I have all new laboratory equipment um, in-house so we can do all sorts of lab work, microscopes, so we are being able to diagnose things within minutes as opposed to days. Uh, we got some fresh paint in the shelter. We have new cat condos were installed. Emergency equipment was upgraded. Um, got some new uh, first aid kits throughout the, throughout the facility. Updated some landscaping and got rid of some old flooring that was in the kitchen area. And that's important because that is where the volunteers go and that is part, partially where we hold um, our events as well. So looking forward, even though we're in it, 2023, <laughs> uh, new countertops are going to be installed uh, in the lobby reception area. Uh, reconstruction of dog play yards, I'll show you, the, that'll be uh, one of the next slides here coming up. That's a proposal. The new HVAC system was actually just installed uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, new outbuilding, hopefully for some training. Uh, be nice to have an area where our behaviorist, our on-staff behaviorist can go and actually take, our goal is to have her take clients who have just recently adopted and give them training classes to help, again, keep that animal um, in the home. Uh, we're going to get a new main cat room. We're um, maneuvering some other spaces in the area. And then there's the photo of the cages I came and proposed with you guys um, a couple months back. So those are um, being built. They should be here in the next few weeks. And Katniss says it's the end. But here is a, a rendering um, talking a little bit about yards and hopefully some upcoming projects that we can look forward to. Um, the top left is an aerial view currently of what the animal shelter um, looks like. Our yards are in a, a state of repair at this point where we really need to get something going. Um, we have chain link fence, um, which of course, um, you know, wear, wears after a while. Um, so this proposal here would have some custom fencing done so animals can not only chew through fencing, this fencing would um, also allow them not to dig underneath um, and How escape. far down does it go? So, so with this proposal, um, we would be going down about three or four feet. Um, and then what we're doing is that there would be drains in there as well because we're also proposing artificial turf be in. As opposed to right now, our yards actually have a gravel ground, which as you can imagine gets very hot um, in the summer for the animals and very difficult for them to run and get their footing. Um, so we'll, we'll obviously be talking more about that in the future, but this is a rendering, hopefully, of um, good things to come for the shelter. That's all I have. Hey, very good. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you, you know, 30-second yeah. answer? 
What's going on with feral cats? So with feral cats, when um, we get a phone call, say, from somebody, oh, hey, I have a community of feral cats out there, the first thing we do is we're going to talk about our TNR program. Um, they can come in. They can rent a trap. Again, we do our surgeries on Thursdays every week. Uh, they go ahead, trap the cat. We give them all the supplies that they need to trap that cat as well. So if they need extra food or anything like that to trap, we certainly can do that. Do we take feral cats? Do we take in feral cats only if they're sick or injured? And then? If they're sick or injured, they get evaluated by, by our on-staff vet um, to determine whether that animal, you know, how, how badly is it injured. Obviously, you know, we have to triage every situation um, for that. Yeah. But the TNR program has actually been very good. We haven't had a lot of opposition to it. Anybody who calls has been, been really excited about the program and participation has been great um, up until the point where we have a waiting list. So at this point, too, I will say we did um, 115 surgeries for TNR, and that was from April until December of last year. And with the numbers that I have for January and February, and those being the slow, harder months, you know, supposedly it was supposed to be cold anyway. Winter didn't decide to show. But um, we are projected to do well over 200 if we continue at the rate that we're going. No, that's mm -hmm. great. <clears throat> well, thanks for your work. We're, we're a uh, rescue dog family. So you need another? We just got, I actually, so. <laughs> it's funny you say that. You know what? Uh, you know what? No. Be careful. <laughs> Be careful. No. I went there just to visit a few weeks back, and I, they tried to hand me a cat going out the door. out with two dogs. We're salesmen, you know? <laughs> yeah. So we went there about six months ago, and uh, we were looking for a small dog, didn't care, and uh, they didn't have any. We ended up going to uh, Delaware to, um, but just a, a suggestion. Yes. I, I asked if we could put our name on a on a list, and the volunteers were wonderful. They just said that they didn't really do that, and if something came in, they would not call us. So, just mentioning something. This is before your time. I'm sure. This yeah. is before your time. Yeah. So we we do try to accept. So what we always tell everyone too is just to submit applications as well. So if that you're looking for something maybe breed specific or or small, you know, you know a lot of people live in apartments that have restrictions. Um, if you submit applications, adoption applications, we do keep them on file, and then this way when things do come in. So it's not necessarily a waiting list, but it is another avenue to go. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank, Thank you. Much. Great job. Great job. All right. All right, commissioners. That uh, concludes all of our presentations for this evening, so we can uh, move into the action items for tonight. So if you want to flip over to tab uh, number three. We've got uh, 11 items, most of which are budget amendments, and then we have two desk items. So, tab three, item number one, on page one, is a uh, memorandum from Steve Chanley and James Wood, and this involves the public landing ramp permit and boat slip fee uh, proposed increases in those fees for this coming year. Those amounts are shown on the on the memo. So the annual permit fee, I'll let I, I can let James or I, I move motion. to authorize Department of Parks and Recreation Public Landings Division to increase the rate of, for ramp permits, vendor permit fees, and boat slips. Second. All right. So we have a motion. We have a second. Take it away, boys. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to have our. Uh, request and recommendation in front of you tonight it's really part of the fy24 right. uh, budget process um, public landings is an enterprise fund so our revenue and expenditures balance um, we've held off on fee increases for a long time and we've always been conservative with both our estimate estimates for revenue and and the amount of expenses we really incur so uh, it's a budgetary, um, each year we look at all this stuff and, and we've held off and been proud of that and believe these are realistic and modest increases that um, our patrons will accept. Um, we have uh, two different categories. One is the boat ramp permits, the landing permits. Um, the stickers you'll see on the bumpers of the car to launch your boat. Um, currently, the Maryland in-state rate is $35. We're 
recommending going up five dollars to forty. And for our TV audience, that was thirteen years ago. Was the last time that was raised? Correct. <laughs> so we um, and this would uh, everything I'm speaking about tonight wouldn't take place until uh, essentially calendar year twenty four um, when we're saying December twenty first twenty three because that's when the next next calendar year's permits would be gone. Um, by comparison, Talbot County's um, annual rate is $45. So um, the out-of-state rate is 70 <clears throat> currently, and we're proposing also a $5 increase to 75. And by comparison, Kent County is at 75 for that. Um, we um, are also suggesting helping uh, acknowledge the fee, the cost that some of these local businesses incur just to, making the transaction. So, so that's that's what the vendor permit fee is. So right. that's what we pay. They keep a dollar grocery stores to sell our landing permits for yeah. us. Yes. Okay. So yeah. that's the, so they'll so they were getting a dollar fifty for every permit that they sold. Right. And they're not going to get too fit. Yeah, and okay. that does not cover their costs, and we all acknowledge that. But we hope they have some foot traffic. They'll buy some bait or fishing rods or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, while they're there. A lot of our sporting goods stores, uh, Chesapeake Outdoors and and others, uh, uh, Price and Gannon, Drapers, you know, different uh, outposts. Par partner with us. Sure. They all sell our permits. Mr. Wood, is the annual fees from the day they buy it one year, or is it calendar? It's calendar year. We try to get them out in December. So if you if you're a duck hunter, <laughs> uh, you'll get 13 months out of it. So if they buy it in May, they're paying the whole. Right. Most of the boating season is you know May through October. So the later you go, yes, it. it um, and that's why we also offer a daily fee if you if you don't go enough times. You know, we have that option as well. Could it be annual on the day they buy it? No, it, it starts on, it's a calendar year sticker. Could it be changed? We so do could it, it be changed? Steve is shaking his head. I'm shaking my head now because we do it by color, by year. So in yeah. order to enforce the, the use of the permits, making sure no one is using an expired permit, we know that blue is. So right now this year it's yellow. Yeah, so yellow is the current color. So if we see someone with a blue permit, we know no, that it's they old. don't have a current So Chris is tied. We can give them a warning. Not yellow. <laughs> Looks yellow to me. It's next year. That's his shirt. <laughs> All right, I'm colorblind too. That's we, we established that. <laughs> Go ahead, James. Um, you got Patrick. <laughs> that's light. That's the um, kind of the boat ramp side of things. Um, uh, Public Landings also runs three marine, county run marinas um, one in Centerville, the one in Kent Narrows, which is known as the Queen Anne's. Waterman's Boat Basin at Kent Arrows, and then Dominion, we have six slips down there. And 172 slips total. Um, we're proposing a $50 per year increase from 750 to 800. Um, please note that that includes electricity. It's an annual rate. Um, the renters are allowed to choose between paying the full rate or splitting it into two payments. Um, by comparison, uh, Talbot County for a similar slip would be a thousand dollars. And, um, so we try to keep it low, but again, to balance our budget, we heard sure. uh, how, 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 what's the waiting list look like? A couple we of years. A, we have a long waiting list. <laughs> <laughs> At these rates, you will continue to have a long waiting we list. We are a good deal, but we, we have a good, really good long-standing watermen that you know are, are working for a living and that's the whole point and and the recreational boaters are in other in the other marinas as well and um so all right thank you thank you any more questions for uh, for the game so we have a motion and we have a second to raise the fees all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed so moved. Thank you for considering. I know it's good job, James. Thank you, gentlemen.
right, commissioners, item number two on pages two through 51 is the Federal Transit Administration and Maryland Transit Administration certifications and assurances that uh, packet that is required for the FY 2024 annual transportation plan for Queen Anne's County. Uh, these documents inform FTA and MTA that Queen Anne's County Area Agency on Aging certifies that it will operate our public transit system in and our statewide specialized transportation assistance program in compliance with all of those certifications. So this is about a $450,000 operating grant for our transit. I move to adopt the authorizing resolution number 2304 for the Federal Transit Administration and Maryland Transit Administration certifications and assurances FY 2023 packet to certify that Queen Anne's County's Department of Community Services Area Agency on Aging will operate the public transit system and the statewide specialized transportation assistance program. Second. Uh, so we have a motion and we have a second. Is there any questions? None. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? So moved. Well, thank you, commissioners. Our next item is item number three on pages 52 through 56, and this is from the Queen Anne's County Soil Conservation District. This is also for a proposed plan review fee increased. Um, and we have um, the district manager, Anthony Riggi, he's here this evening. Uh, this is a fairly lengthy schedule. Also, it's been, um, it hasn't been revised in quite a number of years. So um, could I get a motion on, on this fee schedule? And then. I move to approve the increase of review fees for sediment control and ag stormwater management plan review as brought forth by the Queen Anne Soil Conservation District. Second. So we have a motion and a second. You have the floor, sir. Um, thank you, commissioners. Uh, just wanted to get together tonight. We haven't raised our fees since 2017. Um, so we're trying to get in line with our neighboring districts in Caroline, Talbot, and uh, Kent. Um, so we proposed, as you have in your packet, proposed increasing our fees $100 an acre for our full plans. That's over 15,000 square feet up to 10 acres and then $200 an acre beyond that. We've also uh, proposed going from 100 to $150 for what we call our single family home uh, standard plan. We have a proposed increase from 75 to $100 for the forest harvest review and $150 for our small shoreline uh, bulkhead erosion sediment control review. Anything over the 15,000 would go back to the full plan review fees. Um, nurseries are the same. Um, poultry house construction, we propose an increase from $200 uh, per poultry house to $250 per poultry house. And then on our ag storm water management, we propose going from 100 for between 1,200 square feet and one acre, uh, 100 per plan to 150 per plan. And then from one acre to five acres, from 200 to $250 a plan. Um, greenhouses, we also had an increase of $50 um, for the 0.1 one to 5 acres and 5.1 to 10 acres, an increase of $250 from 10 to 15 acres, and $500 over 15 acres. So poultry house construction, stormwater management, increased the fee to, from 200 to 250 and the uh, per poultry house fee from 100 to 150 we also had fees here for uh, inspections, so pre-construction meeting, site inspections during construction, and as-built certifications for nurseries, greenhouses, and poultry house construction. We did take out the as-built certification fee because the engineering firm will be responsible for conducting the as-built, but we did increase our pre-construction meeting and our site inspections um, from 100 to 150 to 300 to 450 respectively. We also have a fee um, that we increased from 250 to $300. Um, that is a poultry site preliminary investigation fee, which the district will put together a proposed plan to make sure that what uh, the uh, applicant wants to do will meet the setbacks of not only Queen Anne's County, but the Maryland Department of Environment before they have to uh, go hire an engineering firm or talk to a realtor or anything. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. And you said this is, was the last time these rates were increased was 2000? 2017, okay. yes. Okay, and, and, and you 
have determined that it's in line with some of our other jurisdictions? Yes, actually, we're, the 150 for the single lot is equal to Caroline, actually Talbot and Ken are at 200. Okay. So uh, a young couple gets married, they want to buy five acres up county, or maybe their parents give them five acres. What's their charge? So any review, any plan on a parcel two acres or more that's less than a half an acre disturbance, that's there is no fee. We, we, there, an erosion sediment control plan. Five acres. Mm -hmm, an erosion sediment control plan is not required for the construction of that home as long as they stay under one half acre disturbance. <clears throat> That's footprint, Patrick, is what he's saying. This is the footprint of the construction. If it's under one half acre, there's no charge. Yeah, so the house, so that's the driveway. Sizable. That's 20,000 square feet of disturbance. Correct. So that's a good. That's a pretty that's huge a sizable foot. disturbance at that point. Yeah. 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 So two acres or more, you can disturb up to a half an acre. And you're, you're not exempt from uh, controls, but you're exempt from requiring a plan. And we would send over an exemption to planning and zoning, letting them know that oh, they would be. What's, so what's an example of over 10 acres? What would that be? What kind of business would that be? So, well, the, the, the solar arrays up in, in Churchill were 450 acres. Uh, um, which one that we've had? Well, poultry houses anywhere. Basically. Well, poultry houses, right, yeah. I mean, you're going to take. Well, but that's a different classification. That has a different classification. That's, we just did that's one. That's 300 bucks. Format. Yeah. So we just did. Um, the last, one of the phases of the sewer the sewer upgrades in Kent Island, South Kent Island, all of the work together was 30 acres. We did not charge a fee because we do not charge the county or municipalities, but our, our reviewer got paid on what that fee would have been had it been a commercial operation. But a, a shopping center, um, we don't see a lot of big ones. Really more than yeah, we're talking about a example I gave. This is yeah. for more larger. Yes. Larger. Okay. So the, the subdivisions that are already grandfathered in, in the, within the um, growth zones. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Any other questions? Uh, All right. So we at. So the same thing for a nursery, right? Yes. Nursery falls under ag, so it'll be a little different. Mm. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I'm good. Okay. Um, we have a motion. We had a second. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take vote. Anybody? Uh, everybody in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? So moved. All right. And that would go into effect uh, June 1st. Right. Thank, Thank you. you Super. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Tony. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, commissioners. Item, item number four on pages uh, 57 through 62. Uh, we have. Um, we received one citizen sponsored text amendment this year, and this is county ordinance, uh, proposed county ordinance 2302. As you know, we accept citizen sponsored text amendment applications during the first 10 days in February each year. And this year we received 2302 from Jamal's of Kent Narrows, care of Joe Stevens. Uh, it's a waterfront village center district looking for bonus density provisions for mixed use residential density in the WVC with retail, commercial, and services uh, use not to exceed 5% of the gross floor area. So this would, um, we're looking for a motion here to convey this So this, this is to just to send it to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Which we have to this do. Is, that we is, have to do this by review. Right. That so, is correct, Commissioner. I move to convey a citizen sponsor text amendment 23-02, submitted by Jamal, Jamal's Kent Narrows LLC to the Planning Commission for investigation and recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any just, questions or comments? Just so the citizens know, so when the citizen sponsor text amendments come in, we're making a motion, but we have to make this motion. We have to send it to Planning Commission and let them review it. They'll come back to us, the recommendation. Then we'll have a hearing. They'll be hearing the Planning Commission. Then we'll have a hearing. So this being introduced is just a keeping formality. the cogs going, a formality. There will be lots of discussion going forward. So and it's everybody on social media just It's not that chill he's for developing minute. anything. No. It's just. It's, in a typical time frame for this, and at least in my experience here, is it's a six to eight month process before longer. it ever comes back to any kind of realization in front of us again right. usually so um and so safe, social media can so save your outrage yeah, social yeah. media for a little a six more months. months i mean if you want to do it now but just you know save some for later pace yourself. save some you don't it's a right. 
Don't waste it all now. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a marathon. Anybody else? All right, we have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? So moved. Thank uh, you, Commissioners. <laughs> All right, item number five, uh, we can move into the budget amendment section here. Item number five on page 63 is budget amendment CC48. This is for the um, Department of Communica or, uh, DES Communications. And this basically increases budget authority and recognizes the budget authority for DES for the overall grants they received from the 911 board for the next gen system. It is, uh, they received three different grants totaling uh, one million $58,498. This is essentially is a technical amendment to recognize these grant funds that came in. We, we book them, but we didn't have any of the money. We didn't pay any of the bills. It all gets paid directly by the 911 board, so it's just really for the, uh, for the auditors. I move to approve budget amendment CC48, FY 2022 DES communications. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Moved. All right, thank you, commissioners. Uh, item number six on page 64 is budget amendment CC33, Chesapeake Heritage Visitor Center bulkhead replacement. And this amendment increases the budget authority uh, in that project in the amount of $33,275 to recognize additional grant funds and to provide additional funding to uh, uh, meet the deficit of the overall project expense. I move to approve budget amendment CC 33. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, any comments or discussion? I see none. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? So moved. All right, thank you, commissioners. Item seven is budget amendment CC 34, Riverside Remediation. Uh, this amendment establishes a final budget authority for the Riverside Remediation Project. Project is complete, uh, but we were overspent by $102,562. Public Works uh, would like to move that, that amount from another project to cover that deficit. I move to approve Budget Amendment CC34, Riverside Remediation. Second. Sorry. Sorry. Um, this was that the, the mold mitigation that Yes, it was. Yes, yes, Commissioner. And and it's completed. Everything is all done. All complete. And everybody's moved back in. Everyone's back in. There's yes. a lot more than just mold. Once oh, I know. In there. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you open up, you take down a wall, and Needed you work. lift up a floor, and you find something else. And needed work. Yep. Yeah. So to be honest, to be over budget by 102 thousand isn't for the size and capacity of that project. That that's really not a lot. So, all right. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. And opposed? So moved. Okay, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, item 8 on page 66 is Budget Amendment CC35, Board of Education Athletic Tracks. And this is a budget amendment due to a change order in that project. Uh, so we needed an additional 22,000 uh, budget authority to finish that project for um, 377,470. The amendment was for an additional $22,470. Uh, motion to approve budget amendment CC 35. Second. Um, maybe the band could help pay for this. <laughs> okay, that was a poor form. I apologize. <laughs> we, have a second. we have a second. So noted. Any other ridiculous comments? None? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> so moved. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, item number nine on page 67 is budget amendment CC36 for the YMCA. Uh, this was a grant, a CDBG grant that we had booked on the, uh, in the project expense that we never received. Uh, so we're just removing that $800,000 uh, budgeted grant amount from that budget. I move to approve budget amendment CC36. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments? Is that, what, uh, so is, is that what is done. precipitating the uh, request from the senator? The, the lack of those funds, or are they oh no, no, this was just a grant that it, I know it was for the. It was because of the senior center component of the YMCA. We were getting that originally. What happened? I mean, well, we de we decided not to go after this grant because it would have kicked us into some other uh, uh, wage 
restrictions in terms of Davis Bacon for this particular amount of money. It would have been in an arrears grant, so it wasn't something that we wanted to pursue for this particular project in terms more. of cost. You said Davis Bacon. I got yeah. it. We're good. Yeah. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. All right. Thank you, Commissioners. Item number 10 on page 68 is Budget Amendment CC37 for the Sheriff's Department. And uh, our Sheriff's Department was awarded a local agency license plate reader grant for FY23. Uh, this reimburses for the purchase of that uh, plate reader uh, for $202,406. Motion to approve CC37. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So moved. All right. Thank you, Commissioners. And our last budget amendment this evening is Budget Amendment CC38. Parks and Recreation for the Skate Park. Uh, it's on page 69, and this establishes budget authority in the Parks Skate Park project for the construction of the skate park at Cocky Lane. Again, that is grant funded for $665,190, and an additional $100,000 will be used from our uh, recreation, Parks and Recreation Impact Fee program. Can I get a motion? A motion to approve CC38. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So moved. Right. Just so It'll be done next month, right? Skateboard. I want to see Scott. Uh, yeah. Get those roller skates ready, all right? Okay, <laughs> uh, we have two desk items. Uh, desk item one is congressional earmark request from the uh, Queen Anne's County Family YMCA from Robbie Gill. And this is a support letter to Senator Van Hollen on, on their behalf to support their request. They're seeking $1.38 in a con congressionally directed spending to support the construction of the Career Development and Resource Center within the uh, Queen Anne's County Family YMCA. I move to execute the YMCA of the Chesapeake Congressional Directed Spending Support Letter. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Um, any questions or comments? It's pretty boilerplate, right? Mm -hmm. um, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? So moved. Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. And our final item this evening is desk item number two. This is a letter that was requested by our delegation. Uh, this is for the Rural Health Collaborative Pilot Repeal and Midshore Health Imp Improvement Coalition funding. This is a support letter for House Bill 497 and Senate Bill 498, which repeals the provision of the law uh, governing that original pilot and requires the governor to continue that under a new program and provide funding for that beginning in fiscal 24 of um, roughly $150,000 a year, you know, for that five county uh, group of um, Health officer. So we can make a motion for both, right? We don't yeah. have to do them separately. That's right? fine. I move to execute the Rural Health Collaborative Pilot Repeal and Midshore Health Improvement Coalition Funding Support Letter. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments regarding that, Jack? Nothing? No, it's, it's uh, it, they need to move forward with it in this. Unfortunately, we've got to do it legislatively because of Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Okay, Commissioners, that is all of our new business this evening. Uh, we can move to press and public comments. Is there anybody else that has any? Okay. So anybody? Anybody want to speak here? We'll close public comment then. Okay. So Round table? Okay. Hmm. Jack. Sure. I'll go first. I saw him writing earlier. He had a busy day today. I was, I was doing. <laughs> no, I actually, yeah, so I, I did. I actually uh, was at the State Board of Education this morning um, presenting on the, uh, for, for Kerwin and basically going to bat for our own local Board of Eds and all the local Board of Eds here in the state to get some clarity on what the funding for Kerwin is going to look like and the fact that we need to kind of get the information disseminated out a little earlier than we are where we are in the budget process right now. Um, because it not only puts a strain on them getting their budget together to get to us, but then last year, you all remember when we got the uh, rate increase at the 11th hour right before we are ready to strike our budget. So just to work with them collaboratively and, and the counties to work with the state and uh, hopefully 
get a dialogue to where we all are on the same page and it'll make the process a little bit more seamless in terms of you know what the numbers are because unfortunately now the downside to that is that the Kerwin is costing a lot more than originally anticipated. What? Um, yeah, no, I know. I know. Isn't that crazy? Shock so, crazy. It, I gotta get Bruce to go find some old tape. But there was a guy that sat at this table and said this a few years back, more than once. Uh, that this was I'm cost shocked. Yeah. It's only, but anyway, it's only three million, right? I wish. Um, so uh, you know, stay tuned with that. In, in Annapolis, I, and Phil kind of made a sarcastic look about Annapolis, and, and it's crazy now. Chris and me were on a rural county coalition call last night, and some of the bills that are coming out in Annapolis are, are just so far-fetched. Um, what I see a common um, common denominator amongst a lot of them is that these, these programs are going to get created and they're, and they're going to have a two-year lifespan with the state supporting them and funding them, and then the state's going to probably pull their funding away, which, you know, after you've been doing this a while, you learn what that means is that's going to become a county unfunded mandate two years from now because it's very hard to pull a program back that people like after the fact um, because the state can't fund it. Um, and there's a, there were several of them last night. I know probably at least a half dozen to a dozen that we debated that, that all kind of fall in that category. So I'm hoping a lot of it falls on deaf ears and doesn't go anywhere because, you know, again, with, with, with the school funding where it's going to wind up in the next couple of years and just keep piling that on, is, it, it, it's going to get tough um, in terms of uh, budgetary uh, constraints. Um, the other thing is the 1812 Memorial, and I meant to ask Steve when he was in here, did we get that refaced so you can read the names again? I do not know, but I can check on that. Yeah, it's yeah. three years old. Yeah. yeah, I don't know whether it was well, there bad was, materials there or was, whatever. There was a, an accident down there. Somebody ran into one of the signs. You're talking about the signs around No, the, the actual, the, the, the placard on the top, you can't even read the names on there anymore. They've all okay. faded out to the really? point where you all can't right. read on right. that. So. I'm going to check on that. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, obviously, uh, based on uh, Mr. Blanton's uh, comment about the SROs, I know we put additional funding in to make sure those were in the schools. I'd like to check on that and have a follow-up mm -hmm. that that's being done. Okay, um, we'll do. And so, <laughs> Kathy said it, but she made a comment earlier. That's what triggered my comment about the uh, funding. Is she said, get used to something, and then they take it away. I mean, that's kind of where we're going to be sitting with a lot of these other programs that may come out. And I mean. Uh, COVID was bad, but we all knew that was a bubble that was going to burst at, at some point. So reality is finally back where it should be. Um, and then the Thompson Creek issue, I'm sure you're going to touch on that, Chris. That was one that came up. And then there's another one out there, I think, a bill, and we are going to, I think, come out against, and maybe we should talk about whether we want to, is there's a Sunday waterfowl hunting bill that most of the shore counties are coming out against. Um, we have not designated a position where we're at on it, but I... A lot of feedback I'm getting, it sounds like uh, it, it's a bad bill and we should uh, come out against it um, with, the, with our other uh, Eastern Shore counties. So, so my feeling on it is, you know, Sunday, you, you talk about Sunday hunting, but, you know, the people that are involved in this industry, I imagine if you asked any of them, they'd like to have Sunday off, you know. So I think if you have Sunday hunting, you know, that, now they're working seven days a week. Yeah, and this is on the water, so the that water. sound is traveling. It's a lot different than hunting on someone's farm, right? It's a day of rest. Yeah. So, so um, I, I, I think we should probably get a general consensus. We have can a bill do number that. on that. Is there a time frame on that? Uh, do you remember what it was, Chris? I don't, but JJ Jacobs. Jay Jacobs has it. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll look at okay. it. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I know Kent County is taking a position against it. I, I'm uh, uh, Talbot did. Talbot did. Uh, I'm inclined to side with them. I think. Is uh, there a time frame which we have? Do we have to have a letter, or we just have a verbal? I think there's a hearing Friday. Yeah. I think it's okay, we said so we can't wait for Jim then. Right. No, okay. we have to. Yeah, and is it a letter we have to send? Or just, just yeah, let our delegation know? We, we we took, the delegation wants to know our position. They want to know our position so okay. they can take it to the floor. So we can certainly get a general consensus. And, and just, to, just to clarify, so this bill is part of, and, it, and the bill came from the Western Shore. It didn't even come from an Eastern right. Shore County. It came from Anne Arundel and Baltimore County, where there's two sponsors on both sides. Um, the genesis of it is that it is to increase hunting licensing rates was is the real bulk of this bill and then they stuck this um waterfowl bill in there and they really all i think our delegation wants to do is amend amendments. that out right they support want to amend out that portion of the sunday hunting because apparently the rates and fees on the other side are uh due to be um increased, increased anyway so 
Yeah, so I think they just want to get this out of the bill to make it a better bill that, that doesn't affect the waterfowl. I mean, when you would general consensus, you, Chris? Yeah, I'm, I'm opposed? The support with amendments that. Uh, Patrick, yeah, opposed? Yeah. Opposed? Okay. Yeah, let well, the delegation the know counties. that we're in opposition of it. Um, and. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that's it. I guess, I, I mean, I guess the Langenfelder thing, that's going to be constantly, that's a dynamic process going on. It's not, we're not going to get a clear cut answer. I do recommend that uh, take some of the advice and we do get the state to, to, or somebody to come in here and sit in front of us five um, and present this uh, <clears throat> so it can be taped um, and, you know, the public can have their opportunity to come in and, and, and even if later we do our own internal town hall to, to get some feedback. I, I think one of the things, and, and it was touched on as one of the comments, is the roads are not going to be able to handle that kind of traffic. Um, even when it was prior, there's no way that you had 8,000 vehicles and large tandem vehicles going down that road. At, there's so. less vehicles under this than Langenfelder's health heyday. I agree with that. He's right. Langenfelder would have. But you think with the, with the weight there? Yeah, what? but the, with the weight, I mean, I'm just, the weight they're going to be hauling, you think? I mean, my thing is, look, if, if they want to come in and do this, we need to get the road upgraded. So let them, the road does uh, let them pay to upgrade the road Absolutely. so that it's not our headache later. We did it with York Sand and Gravel over here in, in Ingleside. We made them upgrade to uh, asphalt so that they didn't tear up our county roads that would affect our farmers going up and down there when, when they're actually doing their job. So I think that's the least we should ask for at this point is to make sure the roads are wide enough and that they they can withstand this traffic over the time. It's a very small portion that's county road, majority. Uh, exactly. I know it's a state issue, but that's what I'm saying. It's something that we should. So would another compromise be that we ask the state, we send them a letter asking them to pave not just that portion that you're alluding to, but maybe down to where the community ends? The affected area. If they. If they it, I, it's not in that part of the community, though. It's where, there, where there's a get down to end of the point, there's a why. Right. And that's the road that becomes county. Before that, it's all state. Right. So it's really that, a, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So why not ask the county to repave that when they're, state done, thing? No, the state. when they're done? Have the state to repave. State. That's what I could. Yeah. To yeah. county. Yeah. So yeah. we know what you meant. Yeah. 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 We know what you meant. But but I say do it in advance because. Right. Do it now. Yeah. Do this, it now before they start the construction. The second thing to that gentleman's point about dumping <laughs> the cement. Caroline County would take the cement. They'd be happy to take the cement from the state. Well, reclaim concrete so, right now is a big business. I'm, I'm driving into Baltimore today, right there where Resco used to be. They're doing it right there. And it's, I mean, those, they had four different concrete crushers in there just busting up old concrete. And they had, you know. Yeah, that's my point. Well, why, why dump yeah, it in the Yeah, they're reusing it. They're repurposing it. So why not do it? That's my point. Why dump it in the bay? But also to his point, the toxicity of what may be coming out of there. And, and I, I know he misspoke, but that, that bridge is 75 years old, not 50. The other one's 50. So, but at the end of the day, 75 years ago, some of the materials in there, even at the core of the bridge, may not be suitable. I, I think that Asbestos. part of the plan is going to be revised with the new secretary of DNR in there. It's going to have a different focus than the prior one, and I think the environmental things are probably something that's going to be front and center. But to but, the community's concern, wouldn't it behoove us to send a letter to so the state we've, and DNR? We have some outreach already going on. Three or five with with uh, DNR on this and well, trying to get us? some some us? meetings with what the community right? as well. I think we got to get more information from them and from the VTA on the scope of it because. A lot of what's out there circulating about the project is not accurate. Um, a lot about what this, what the end result of the site is not accurate. So it's, we're gathering some of that information so we can make sure the right information is getting out there. Um, and then we can tell them, and I think then I did talk to do, do But, but the DNR guy did say they were going to dump the cement. In the, yeah, no, no, in that, the and, uh, but that might change. I think. It was not a very good presentation from DNR. I'm done too. To say the least. <laughs> We're really doing roundtable here. Patrick, anything? Yeah. So uh, I don't have a lot of information, but as I was coming here, and, and Todd might have more information than I do, Jim, and, and really a lot of credit goes to Jim, Todd, and, and Kent County, and Dr. Ciotola, and Katie, and all these folks who have just been in the fight of mental health for a long time. I'm, I'm just kind of coming in at, you know, 
I'm sitting on the bench, <laughs> pinch hitting 25 players later. Uh, but very exciting. Um, we've just been doing a lot of work behind the scenes, trying to bring the counties together to look at a facility for behavioral health, mental health, so that when kids are in crisis situations, they're stuck in the emergency room, there's no beds at Shepherd Pratt, mom and dad don't know what to do, and Chris and I have talked about it too. We're, the counties are trying to find a place to have a crisis center for these kids, kind of like a Shepherd Pratt, but for the Eastern Shore. And to use Dr. C's words, we're, we're a desert here on the Eastern Shore. We have none of these facilities. So through our mind's eye, we thought that if we could get the state to bequeath the vacant part of the Witsit Center, and notice I said vacant part. I didn't say the Witsit Center. I said the vacant part for a song, you know, a dollar, the land and the building. And then if they could, I mean, best case scenario. If Make it a regional they, effort. That's right. Give, uh, fix it, whatever it is, $10 million or so, give it to Kent County, Kent County would give it to the Upper Shore Regional Council. Upper Shore Regional Council would uh, hire a uh, medical team to run it, staff it, and, and, and help our adolescent kids before they end up in the Witsit Center. You see the point here? Mm -hmm. So here's the good news. Um, we've been kind of come, trying to figure out how can we talk to the new Secretary of Health, uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Herrera Scott, and it just so happens that Gene Ransom knows her. So um, Gene talked to her, and f I don't know if it was Gene or Steve Ahrens or Senator Hershey or you, I don't know where it came from, but she's going to visit the Witsit Center next on Friday the 10th. So this is really good news for the Eastern Shore. So um, the counties, Kent County's on board work. Well, I don't know if you're on board. I'm hoping that you, that you get on board uh, Cecil County was is partially on board. They want a lot more information. Same thing with Caroline. So what we're hoping is, is at least one count, each county will send one or two representatives to meet with the doctor and kind of share the, the vision I was just alluding to. And um, Bill Webb has been really very active. Uh, a lot of credit goes to Commissioner Fithian uh, and uh, the other, and, and uh, Commissioner John Price and Commissioner Albert Nickerson, Commissioner uh, 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 Gregory and uh, Chief uh, County Executive uh, Daniel Hornberger from Cecil. So slowly the team is coming together. Chris is aware of what I'm talking about. Todd, Todd is. So um, it's it's just, you know, we're just hoping to move the ball. We've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of things that got to come together. I, I, I mean, I, I think with the passion and, and the understanding of where we are so far, where we've been, I think you'd be perfect to represent us. I know. No, no, no. It's not. It's not he or she. It's us. I know, but the, the, the but send somebody. But say, yeah, I'm saying I, the sending of somebody. I, I, oh well, Todd's going to go. He's nominated you. All mm -hmm. in favor? Yeah, I mean, honestly, Patrick, to be honest with you, you don't need a consensus here. We've been on board with it since over a year ago when it first came to light that they were going to close it. So this commission is definitely supporting whatever you want to do up there. Honestly. Well, I'm just, I'm inviting you if you'd like to come. It's at 9 o'clock. Well, Let's say just moving down the road, what, I'm, what I would. You can't have any more than two. two. So you don't have a quorum. Well, I'm hoping Jim will come and grit, whatever. Yeah. Um, what am I trying to say? What I am hoping after that, we're going to have to send her a follow-up letter. I would hope that my compadres here would sign a letter to her sure. reiterating what we're talking about. Yeah. That's a no-brainer. Yep. yep. On board. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? <clears throat> Chris? Um, <laughs> before I talked about some of this stuff, so the um, I attended 
that uh, meeting about uh, the old Langenfelter property um, to say that DNR did a poor performance on doing that presentation is an understatement. Yeah. The, the project has a lot of positive attributes um, that were not properly conveyed and there are a lot of legitimate concerns that the residents there have and they were not prepared to address those. I think a lot of these issues can be um, resolved through some discussions. There's been some outreach to uh, Secretary Kurtz from DNR um, and he's interested in coming and either himself or some representatives meeting with some of the, the community leaders there in that area um, and I'm gonna offer to be at that as well to gather their concerns on a smaller basis and then have a more larger public, um, another public hearing that we'll host and make sure it's done the right way, get the right information out there. We'll get some information together for QEC TV to give people a better understanding about it. Um, what people might not know is so Langenfeld Marine was bought with project open space money and anybody who has come to us and asked us to shut down Terrapin Beach to people who don't live in Queens County know you can't do that. It's project open space money. It's open to everybody. But this place hasn't been open to everybody or anybody. DNR has been using it. Part of the problem is there is a lot of contaminants there. Um, so if this project goes forward there, they will be digging down about what eight inches down, removing the gravel, putting in soil, five acres of grass and 2,300 trees. It would actually become a park. It would be a destination that, you know, the trail could then extend up to at some point in time, which would be great for the people who live up there. They would have a trail to go on. Not, not that we're gonna have a trail there, you know, in a year or so, but it, it would all be a perfect thing to tie in, in in the future as part of planning. So there, there are some positives to it, but the negatives do have to be addressed. Um, and so we're working on that. I want people to know that we're not ignoring that. Um, we don't have a vote on whether it goes there or not but we could certainly have a voice and that's what we're gonna do. Um, we had press and public comment earlier and there was some comment about school safety and I've, I always encourage people to come out and speak, I think that's fine. Um, but it concerns me when we're talking about school safety, I've got two kids in the public school system that we have law enforcement, the sheriff is elected, he handles law enforcement. If you have concerns, you should talk to the sheriff about law enforcement. It is not doing anything for school safety to come in front of a camera and identify where you think there are target rich environments or safety concerns so that some crazy person who's watching QEC TV goes, hey, that's a great idea. I'm gonna go there. So I'm not telling people not to speak publicly, but you may wanna think twice about if you're achieving your goal or if you're being stupid in doing that. Talk to the sheriff. He's in charge of law enforcement. We get briefings, we know a lot more. There's a lot of private stuff that we get. The Board of Ed also gets information private. It's taken extremely seriously. Making analogies to the Board of Ed building and somehow that the schools aren't safe. These are apples and oranges things. The Board of Ed building is falling apart. There, if anybody's toward it, they know. That new building does have to happen, it doesn't mean that if we're doing that, we can't address school security, right? And school security is something we're going to address, but we're not gonna talk about everything that's going on with school security because it's security. You know, you wouldn't build a prison and say, so the prisoners could get out this way because we don't really have, you know, you know, right security there. You, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't build a military base and tell them where the back door is, right? So you're not gonna know everything, but we have Sheriff Hoffman and an excellent staff who work night and day to make sure that our kids are safe. And the school resource officers are doing more than just directing traffic as those cars are coming in. Um, they are doing things during school hours, they're doing things after school hours when there are threats that have to be addressed. So I, I know from my personal conversations with Sheriff Hoffman and members of the staff, they are doing a lot. Is there more that can be done? There's always more that can be done. Will the schools be 100% safe? I'm telling you, no. Society is not 100% safe, right? Right, but we're gonna make it as safe as possible. I'm committed to it, I have kids in the school system. But please, if you see something at the school systems that you think should be addressed on a safety concern, 
please take that to Dr. Salins or Sheriff Hoffman, in particular Sheriff Hoffman, in private conversations we are not broadcasting it because you're not helping the situation. That's just my own little soapbox there because I, I feel very strongly about that, particularly with my own kids in the school, that we need to be smart about the way we're going about doing that. So that's my point. Sorry, off my soapbox, thank you. Very good. Um, and, th and those are good points. I mean, there's things and systems and procedures in place that, that we are unaware of and there's a reason why we're unaware of it. So, um, I, I just wanted to take this opportunity real quick to re read this letter that we received from a citizen in Queen Anne's County regarding our, our ride services. To whom it may concern, <clears throat> I'm writing to express my appreciation for the Queen Anne's County Ride Service. I very recently began using this service and I am utterly delighted with the excellent hospitality I've received from both the people at dispatch as well as the drivers that have taken care of me. This is truly a wonderful service that you are offering. Thank you so much for all you do. Sincerely, Elizabeth. So to the ride share programs and, and, and our transportation component here in the county. Job well done. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate Queen Anne's County High School men's basketball team for advancing to the next round of the state playoffs. And then uh, the Kent Island girls varsity basketball team beat Parkside last night and will advance tomorrow evening to the next round um, of the playoffs. And then just a, 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 you know, my two cents on Langenfegel real quick. You know, when, when a, a developer comes to our county and, and, and proposes a project, there is a process that has to take place. Uh, site approval, um, conceptual plans, stack reviews. Uh, and there's all this that, and then, a, and then of course there's, there's studies done and, and that determine the impact on public safety, on, on traffic, on our schools, and then if there's, if it's determined that there are issues with those categories, then there's mitigation that's mandated that the planning and zoning department requires of the project in order for it to move forward. I think the citizens of Queen Anne's County, particularly the ones up front uh, on Love Point Road, are just simply saying you need to be held accountable for those same processes. Uh, simply because you're the state of Maryland and, and you're a state agency that you could just come in here and, and bully us. And that's just, I mean, that's unacceptable. I agree. Absolutely unacceptable. It was, it was poor execution on their part. It really was. Yep. So hopefully the, these negotiations or, you know, the communication lines of communication stay open. And on that, I will entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Hold it for next time. We're going to hold it for next time.